Uh, once again, uh, good morning, respected guests, speakers, colleagues, presenters, participants, and students. Thank you for joining us today at the ULAB Multicultural Conclave 2022, organized by the Department of English and Humanities at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. I am Sara Andrimbari, a lecturer at the Department of English and Humanities, ULAB. We have with us here today the Vice Chancellor of the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, Professor Imran Rahman, the Pro Vice Chancellor of ULAB, and the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, Professor Shantad Mortiza, and the Head of the Department of English and Humanities, Ms. Arifa Ghani Rahman. Our Chief Guest, Honorable Deputy Minister, Ministry of Education, Mr. Mohibul Hassan Chaudhary, MP, unfortunately could not be with us here today as he is feeling ill. He has sent us his regrets. Um, the title of this two-day conclave is A Dialogic Imagination of Bangladesh, Linguistic, Liter uh, Literary, Linguistic, Cultural Representations, Non-Representations, and Misrepresentations, where we plan to explore and challenge the boundaries of what it means to identify as Bengalis and Bangladeshis. As we observe the 50th year of Bangladesh's independence and the 70th year of the Bengali language movement, we at the DEH believe that it is a crucial time to be re-examining the way we imagine the Bengali identity through the public consciousness, which is often shaped by literary, film, and other mediums of representation. To begin the formal in inauguration of the two-day ULAB Multicultural Conclave, may I at this point request Professor Shamshad Mortiza, Pro-Vice Chancellor of ULAB and Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to ULAB and uh, welcome to the two day conference on a dialogic imagination of Bangladesh literary, linguistic, cultural representation, non representations, and misrepresentations. Now, the title may seem quite overwhelming, you know, especially at a time when the war drums are beating in Europe and we are potentially seeing the birth of the Third World War. Now, Adorno famously said, uh, it's impossible to write poetry after Auschwitz. Uh, it's even barbaric to do so. Uh, can we do something similar? You know, so we are not writing poetry, but uh, engage in a literary activity uh, when uh, we have some sort of barbarism, quote unquote, going on elsewhere in the world. Uh, then again, it is the imagination of a nation that has started the conflict and that makes this discussion even more pertinent. Uh, the heterogeneity, so there will be multiple uh, voices, there will be you know, a polyphonic uh, voices that we'll be hearing. Uh, we'll be hearing us versus them. Uh, we'll be hearing stories, narratives on you know, blames blame shifting and whatnot in the days to come. And there will be media spinning, uh, there will be interpretations, misinterpretations, uh, representations, misrepresentations, and so on. And that is precisely the kind of experience we had, you know, 70 years uh, back. So after the partition, uh, when we have the two nation theory, and we had the first um, awakening in the question of language, you know, so when we had to define our national identity, so within that uh, nation state framework. So at ULAB, uh, especially at the School of Arts and Humanities and um, the English department, you know, we would like to revisit this question of language. Uh, to This is our way of honoring the language martyrs you know, who defined our national identity. But at the same time, we need to go back to understand, you know, what was the idea? You know, what, you know, what was the spirit that led them to get involved in a movement, you know, uh, like uh, Ekush February in 1952. So during this 70th anniversary of the 21st February, you know, 1952, uh, which is considered as a proper beginning of the Bengali nationalist movement, uh, we would like to go back because now that Ekushe has been recognized by UNESCO as International Mother Language Day, I think uh, the dynamics 
uh, the calculus, you know, has shifted. And this overlapped with the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. And that makes it even more interesting. So the title, as you can assume, it goes back to Mikhail Bakhtin's uh, The Dialogic Imagination. And uh, in simple terms, plain terms, so uh, this idea of dialogic, so it embraces uh, a type of heterogeneity in discourses, which means it creates, recreates a reality that is based on the interaction of a variety of subjective consciousness and ways of thinking and speaking about the world. So we are here at a conclave. So we are here at an intellectual academic gathering. And we would like to you know, reflect on this subjective consciousness. We want to create a platform, you know, so over the last in the, in the next two days to talk about these issues because we want to think and we want to speak about the world. So that's the basic core of our, you know, arrangement today. The second part of our title involves uh, the, or it alludes to Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. Yeah, so Benedict Anderson, he depicts nation as a socially constructed community. So it is imagined by the people who perceive themselves as part of a group. So who is in, who is out, when you talk about Bengali nationalism, right? Uh, that's the other aspect of our broad framework. So with this, so we would like to visit some of the, you know, um, overwhelming questions, you know, for example, how Bangladeshi is imagined through literary and cultural texts. So what are the events, you know, that define the essential, you know, Bengaliness? Uh, can we generate discourses on literary, linguistic, cultural non-representations and misrepresentations and their consequences? And how around the 50th anniversary of the independence and the 70th anniversary of 21st February 1951, the nation of Bangladesh is rethought, reread, rewritten, and retold. What are the many imaginations of Bangladesh and how these imaginations are undergoing challenges and changes? How are these imagination in a state of dialogic interaction? So we're planning to you know, ask these questions, you know, in a series of uh, plenary sessions, you know, keynote uh, panels, uh, and we are delighted to welcome over 300 registered participants. And uh, of course, we have participants from over eight countries, four continents, and we also have representation from you know, indigenous communities, right? Uh, in the, you know, over this weekend, you will have about 45 parallel sessions, you know, so we have about 58 submissions. Uh, and of course, I am saving the best for the last. We are going to have three keynote sessions and uh, there are five plenary sessions. And one of them is dedicated to just one poem, Vidrohi by Kazinos Islam. So we are celebrating the 100 years of the composition of that uh, poem by our rebel poet. And uh, that is going to be a very exciting session tomorrow. But let me begin by welcoming our keynote speaker, you know, so Padrusi uh, Awardi, Professor Ganesh N. Devi. So just last night, you know, my colleague, Professor Kaiser Hock, uh, was telling me about the huge compendium, like, you know, so People's Linguistic Survey of India. So the 60 volume, um, you know, so uh, collection, so that Professor Devi has edited. So it's a mammoth, mammoth work, you know, so, and uh, uh, interestingly, Professor Kaiser has a piece in it. And so he shared it last night. And so we were talking about, you know, Professor Devi's uh, contribution to the field. So we are humbled delighted and honored to have Professor Devi as the uh, keynote speaker 
and uh, I'm sure like, you know, so uh, we're going to kick off with some very interesting and thought provoking ideas. So thank you, Professor Devi for your time and generosity. And uh, I need to thank Professor, you know, uh, uh, Guho, like, you know, Sir Ramachandra Guho, like, you know, for introducing Professor Devi to us. And uh, he's expected to speak sometime uh, in March. So uh, that's something we are also looking forward to. And of course, our other uh, keynote speakers, Professor Shagato Bahaduri from Jorla Nehru University. So uh, again, um, amazing scholar. And uh, he uh, comes from the English department, but takes particular interest in, you know, uh, in uh, essential Bengaliness and modernity. And uh, we'd like to welcome him tomorrow, you know, for the uh, other keynote. And our, our very own Professor Said Manzul Islam, sir, he needs no introduction for our local and regional audience. And Monju sir will be also like, you know, speaking today. And uh, he's a man of great wit. And uh, we look forward to, you know, listening to him as well. But, uh, and of course, uh, there will be other plenary sessions and you'll be hearing about it, you know, so when the housekeeping is done. Uh, before I wrap up, I need to thank my colleague, my boss, Professor Imran Rahman, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, without whose support, we couldn't have had this event today. And uh, so thank you, sir, for all your support. And, uh, you know, so um, uh, being a great supporter of the English department. And of course, uh, the entire admin team, so the register, the treasurer, like, you know, so uh, IT, like none others at ULAB. So they have rendered, uh, uh, you know, extensive support for making this happen. Um, and I would like to wish our uh, chief guest, you know, so uh, Deputy uh, Minister, uh, Mohibul Hassan Nawfal, uh, well, uh, we understand that, you know, so he is under the weather, so he just got back from India, and uh, so he's not feeling well, uh, so wish, we wish him um, a quick recovery. And finally, I would like to end by thanking my team, like, you know, I know, like, you know, thanks are not enough, especially uh, Khan Tosef, so who's the convener uh, uh, of, of this particular conclave, so he has been amazing in, like, you know, so... Um, pulling out a rabbit out of a hat. And uh, uh, the department head, Ms. Arifa Rahman, uh, amazing, amazing, uh, you know, initiative, like, you know, so they had, I don't know how many sleepless nights they had in making this happen. So I'm amazed uh, by the conversation they have on WhatsApp groups. Uh, we, we're we having it online. And uh, uh, Arifa's Ariel or Caliban, I don't know how to put it, but uh, our lecturer, senior lecturer, Zakir is one. So again, uh, he's Mr. Magic himself. So he did all the IT works, all the designs, layouts, and also he was coordinating with everything. Uh, so thank you, the Conclave team. Uh, again, uh, so we just had a big conference last month to have another one within such a short span of time. So it speaks volumes of your ability. So I'm proud of uh, the English department. And dear participants, so thank you for sparing your Friday morning with us. It's never easy. So I hope you have a good cup of tea or coffee. Uh, you can switch up your video and have breakfast with us. And I'm sure like, you know, we will have enough food for thought in the next two days. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Mojiza. Um, may I now invite Professor Syed Munzrul Islam, Professor of the Department of English and Humanities at ULAB to please address our audience. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, um, Shamshad, for giving a very um, <clears throat> detailed account of what we can expect in the next two days. I'm amazed to see that um, what was initially planned has become bigger than what we, at least I could imagine. So many people participating presenting papers on such a diversity of range, such a diversity and range of topics. Um, and I'm sure that um, as they speak and as they deliberate, many key issues will come to light, um, which um, will be needed to guide us 
in our study of both language, literature, and also the idea of nation, which is a very challenging one, contested one, uh, which is taking in new dimensions in this world when flashpoints are emerging. And the flashpoints will not only emerge in Europe, but also elsewhere in the world, because there is always a domino effect of such a um, global event as a war. And I have seen how the notion of war has been contested on both sides of the contesting parties. One party is saying this is a limited uh, intrusion of the army, a deployment of forces necessary to defend the integrity of certain areas. The other side is coming up with the notion that this is an all out war. And we are once again left in a definitional quandary. We are not sure which definition holds out at the end of the day. But um, this will be the post COVID uh, world. Um, we expected a world which would be kinder, more compassionate, more caring, and more given to the needs of the people, uh, the marginalized communities, the people who are left out of any system, um, healthcare, education, uh, important systems that form the life of a community and individual. But then we see how people are being left out, how vaccine nationalism has emerged, how vaccine apartheid has emerged. Who could have imagined that there would be margins of death dealing in items which are needed for survival. And how do the merchants make money when people die for the lack of as important an element as oxygen? I have been wondering why the very dark instincts in our soul have been released by this COVID-19. Is it a return of the primitive, a return of the world in which in the stone age when people fought for their territories. I do not know really. I mean, this is so depressing. This morning I woke up and saw on television, people dying on the streets and people just scattering themselves all over European continent in search of shelter in the month, which is still winter, very cool, very unkind and very vicious winter for the people who, do, uh, who are sheltered. Coming back to our conference, and I'm, I'm happy that Shamshad raised this idea that after Auschwitz, you cannot write poetry. But poetry, be, poetry has to be written after Auschwitz, especially after Auschwitz, because poetry can somehow attempt to redress the imbalances created by ethnic cleansing, mass extermination of minorities, um, the killing of languages, which are considered um, unimportant because the number of practitioners is very low, defying the whole idea that a language should not be counted on the use on the number of the users. My belief is if there are 10 people using a language, that claims as much of an attention and respect as a language spoken by 30 million or 300 million people. We seem to forget these ideas when you speak about language. We attach to language the idea of economic development. I myself participate in the dialogue that one day Bangla will be spoken across the globe. When will that one day arrive? Oh, well, Bangladesh attains economic development rivaling the West. And then everyone will come to Bangladesh to look for jobs and they will have to learn the language. What an irony. Language is not supposed to be used for imperial domination or colonial domination. But we have been used to seeing English in that particular role, French in that particular role. I do not know whether we'll see Russian in that particular role in the future. Spanish has been forced down the throats of people. 
if language is a means of domination, control, extermination, stealing people's identity, their agency, then language functions as something which is used for every other purpose than for communication. Language should not communicate viciousness. Language should not communicate prejudice. And language should not communicate hatred. But in this world of global connectivity, in the social communication channels, we see how language is used to take away one's pride, how to, um, how to spread disinformation, which leads to violence, how to spread hatred, which has no end, because hatred is a self-generating force. It's a force of nature almost, which cannot be stopped unless people stop it at the source. Language is a contested idea in today's time. And I would like the participants to keep in mind that this is the month of February in which we asserted our rights to our mother language. There were three important ideas connected with language when we fought for language so many years ago, 70 years ago, almost to the day that we had a realization that language is opening up doors for us. The first one is identity, of course. La language gives one's identity. And that identity is not simply selfhood. That identity crosses over the bounds of selfhood and combines communities. And language should not give one particular community an identity which can be stamped on others. Language-based identity teaches every community to respect each other's identity. And the second aspect of language, of course, is connectivity. It is not simply a means of communication. Language is also a means of establishing cultural contexts, contexts which go beyond the test of time, political experience, experience or whatever. A third aspect of language is its ability to transform culture. And it is true that after 1952, we had an effervescence, a spate of creativity, not simply in literature. And that is very important because language is not simply something people speak. It is also something which is there in any creative aspect. Film has a language. And Shatujit Roy's films, for example, we have models coming from Bangladesh, which are global models of how film can communicate. Even films can communicate through their silence, the most resonant ideas of a particular community. And we have a new beginning in our art and culture. The Institute of Art created artists who understood Western modernism, but did not take unthinkingly Western modernism or modern techniques in their paintings, in their sculptures, but blended them with local culture. So they had something called tropical modernism, which you also see in architecture of the time. Mazharul Islam is an architect who is credited for bringing what is called tropical modernism in our architecture, which is not the kind of um, conspicuous modernism that is taken from the West, lock, stock, and barrel, without realizing that every turn of culture is based on assimilation of those cultural elements from that particular culture into elements of everyday life. So Western modernism is not our modernism. But the element of modernism is important because it, as Ezra Pound says, always goes for the new. And so these aspects are important for us to understand how language movement did not only enrich our literature and made important inroads for writers and, and poets to bring their own imaginations and create collectively um, a body of work which increasingly is seen to be uh, outstanding, 
I can look at the 1950s literature and I marvel at the way they understood how language should be used or can be used, discover a language which had been neglected, combine the language that we use every day with language that our forefathers had used. In other words, go back to the roots of language. These things have been done, but also how language has, language movement has energized other cultural movements. And second aspect of another aspect was not second, another aspect of language has been how it inspired our collective identity in terms of politics, how we imagined a nation. Now this conference today and tomorrow, this conclave has in my opinion, two outstanding themes, very important interconnected themes. One is language, the other is nation. So in, if you know about language, then we have to ask questions. And this is the very important function of any creative mind today or critical mind today is to ask questions, go back to the origin and the roots, and then redefine and reimagine how these original, originary ideas have been translated in our times. When language movement took place, we only thought about Bengali because we all belong to that category called Bengalis. But we did not take into account the multiplicity of language, languages spoken in our own country. We did not, for example, pay the same respect to the Marma's mother language or the Manipuri's mother language. I have grown up in a city where we lived next to a Manipuri community. And I can tell you how beautiful their language is, how expressive, but that language was not at all recognized. It was neglected. Anyone speaking Manipuri would not be given admission into the upper echelons of society. The same thing happened with the minority languages in Chittagong Hill Tracts and also in the plains of Northern Bangladesh. So how can we who fought, fought for our mother language not take into account the rights of those other languages? This is one of the greatest ironies underlying our language book. Fortunately though, from 1999, we have been able to give at least some leave service, but some serious rethinking as well to developing these mother languages. I'm happy to see, and Shamshad, Shamshad has explained it, that an aspect of the two-day conflict is a participation of uh, many ethnic uh, scholars coming from different ethnic, really, uh, ethnic communities. And this will probably be one of the first times in Bangladesh that a cultural conclave is taking place where participation of so many scholars from these communities is giving you a new dimension to the understanding of language and culture. Similarly, the concept of nation has been contested. Rabindranath Thakur, who I consider one of the greatest of theorists of nationalism, has lamented how political-based nationalism, which is full of prejudice, power, and the relationship between power and knowledge, how this politics-based nationalism has become a monster, a monster which now sets fire on the houses of people, and this is a quote from Rabindranath Thakur, sets fire to the houses of people, an arsonist monster, so to say, by the same torch which used to enlighten humanity from the Renaissance down to the age of enlightenment. What an irony that humanity has learned in the earlier times when the first waves of modernism began to be felt from the age of the Renaissance, how the enlightenment torch really burned as something which showed the way. And the First World War, the same torch turned into a weapon of destruction, if not mass destruction. So see, this tenuous notion of nationalism depends on how we define nation. We have to be careful that nation is not simply a political construct, which excludes the other. Nationism or nationalism goes with the say in the same frame is 
it places itself in the same frame as the colonial othering game. If you otherize smaller communities which do not come into your national frame, then you are doing a disservice to the world by promoting your nation at the cost of the other nations. And look at the regional powerhouses. The regional powerhouses, I'm not naming any names, but throughout the world you have regional powerhouses which aspire to control smaller communities because their understanding of nationalism is something which is all pervasive, um, is not inclusive but exclusive, and that exclusivity phenomenon of nation is responsible for all the wars and the conflicts that you see almost becoming our daily bread in this early 21st, 22nd, 21st century. Nation has to be understood as a cultural construct, as something which has connections with nature, environment, with topography, with your natural hydrology. The flows of rivers across barbed wares is not something which respects the national boundaries. The flows of rivers, we have 54 new rivers flowing from India. Imagine if all the 54 rivers are dammed up, you will have a lower riparian nation which will be starving for from the from the uh, uh, need from the want of water so nation should not promote itself to the exclusion of others nation is best understood as an inclusive concept where everyone is free to participate and culture can that give you that kind of inclusivity and culture is such a broad based phenomenon I always admire Raymond Williams' Williams's definition, which tells you that culture is both a collection of values which change our lives on a daily basis and our everydayness. If we combine these two, what we have is an idea of culture, which, which is something which is so relevant in everyday life. It is not something which is boxed in in categories as dance, music, so on and so forth. Culture is our everydayness. And in the, with that, sense of culture being the dominant force. Let's start with the conference today and tomorrow, the conclave. I'm happy with the title. Conclave is something which brings people together, is the convergence factor, isn't it? And the visual culture tells you that convergence is the most important idea in promoting images, which are becoming substitutes for words. And we are living at a time when culture is so sort of diverse uh, and, um, sort of so strong in embracing everyone. In instant communication is possible today, which was not possible 50 years ago. So with that instant communication at our disposal, the power of instant communication, we can also have instant communication of minds. And the last thing I'll say is how, the develop, how developing our minds, make, making our minds broad-based and receptive to range of ideas without prejudice, without prejudice and without um, any particular bias. If we can do that, then that is our only way of not only protecting languages, including all the mother languages that we have in our country. At the same time, the idea of nation not being a sacrosanct entity which cannot be trespassed. Nations should be, in other words, welcoming people to trespass them. Because the moment you learn how to trespass the concept of nation, you bring your own ideas, which you can add to the definition of the bigger nation, and that nation becomes more enriched. With these few words, I welcome all the participants and particularly the uh, keynote speakers. I'm delighted to be in the company uh, of Professor Devi, who I respect tremendously. And then, um, I'm looking forward to listening to these stellar participants, uh, other participants. Thank you very much for giving me the time. I'm really filling up the space given to our honorable minister, but unfortunately he fell sick and he regretted his inability to participate. I'm sure if he sees the video, he will like to be here uh, whenever this conference 
has a rerun. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, sir, for such such an insightful speech. Um, I would now like to request Professor Imran Rahman, Vice Chancellor, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, to give his address and to formally inaugurate the ULAB Multicultural Conclave 2022. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, very good morning to everybody, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was listening with such a interest to Professor Said Manzur Islam's speech, and uh, he being one of the keynote speakers. Um, congratulations to the um, Department of English and Humanities team for putting together such a rich um, conclave. Uh, and one of the things uh, ULAB seems to be able to do, particularly the English department, is put together these things at breakneck speed, you know, with very short lead times. <clears throat> so um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, I was going through the list of uh, plenary speakers, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh Devi and uh, Professor Shogat Bhaduri, and, and so many of the other speakers, a few of them I, I'm familiar with and have the pleasure of knowing. Um, I actually don't have much to say on the actual topic, but I'm happy that uh, this uh, conclave has been arranged you know just uh, three four days uh, following 21st february um, i think this is a very fitting way to uh, commemorate this iconic date in our uh, national history 21st february 1952 which i'm sure most of you know that uh, this is regarded as the proper beginning of uh, bengali nationalism uh, movement in, in east pakistan and uh, we are also kind of uh, still celebrating the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. Uh, so others, uh, including my colleague, Professor Shamshad Murtaza, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of uh, Arts and Humanities have spoken in depth about the thematic considerations, about the objectives of this conference. So I, I don't wish to, uh, go over those again, but I just also am uh, very happy uh, to see the participation of so many students. Um, this is usually not seen. Usually, most conferences are, you know, run by academics and researchers with a colloquium for students. But this is I'm glad the students and teachers and researchers are all together in this melting pot of a conclave. Um, um, <clears throat> so this conference, which kind of as Professor Islam said, is basically uh, broadly will be dealing with the concepts of language and how it's related to uh, culture and, and nationhood or nationalism. Uh, interesting um, topic, and I'm sure the um, deliberations over the next uh, two days will be so varied and so um, uh, rich. Um, I believe that um, there will be a panel discussion um, to observe the centenary of a, another iconic poem by our national poet Tazi Nazrul Islam, and that is, of course, his famous poem called Bidrohi. Um, and I'm sure that panel will kind of rediscover Bidrohi's, uh, you know, relevance to our, our current circumstances. And um, amazing that we have participants from so many countries um, and particularly glad that we have also uh, going to have participants from the our, uh, indigenous community. And I echo Professor Islam's uh, kind of uh, comments about the irony about uh, the fact that uh, although we uh, established uh, International Modern Language Day, you know, we kind of slightly lost sight of our own indigenous languages. Um, to a certain extent, probably that's inevitable. Once a country has a national language, you know, it just steamrolls uh, over uh, other languages. So I think just one of the facts of civilization. Um, 
So there's going to be fun as well. You know, I think in between the uh, the serious talk, there's going to be also uh, uh, lighter moments, um, which which are all part and parcel of a successful conference. So thank you, Arifa, uh, and your amazing team for all the work you've done to put together this conclave and uh, guided, very ably guided, of course, by uh, our own Professor Shamshad and Professor Manzoor. Um, and uh, let me end by officially inaugurating this uh, conclave and hoping that everyone has a really meaningful and useful two days of deliberations. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate your presence with us here today. Uh, dear audience, this brings us to the end of the formal inauguration ceremony.